I would like to discuss briefly the epidemiology, microbiology, risk factors, pathogenesis, diagnosis, and treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis. A little bit about history. Tuberculosis is a very old disease. There is evidence of tuberculosis in skeletal remains about 4,000 before Christ. And TB spine was found in Egyptian mummies 3,000 years before Christ. Hippocrates, in the 5th century before Christ, he described a disease which looks like tuberculosis, and he called it consumption disease. That disease was slowly progressive, leading to emaciation and death of the person. So the disease consumed the patient. In the 17th century, the Belgium pathologist Sylvius identified tubercles in the lung pathologically. Also, Chunlin in 1820, he identified it as a disease and called it tuberculosis in 1839. In France, Villeman in 1868, he proved that tuberculosis is transmissible. He took uh, extracts of the lungs of the patients who died from tuberculosis and injected into rabbits, and the rabbits will develop, develop the same disease and they died. In 1882, Robert Koch discovered the tubercle bacillus, and for that discovery, he got the Nobel Prize. At that time, one-seventh of the deaths in Europe were due to tuberculosis. So it was a very killing disease, and until now, it causes also a mortality. A total of about 1.5 million people died every year from tuberculosis. These are WHO statistics. And TB is one of the top 10 causes of death. Also in 2018, estimated 10 million people as tuberculosis, 5.7 million in men, 3.2 million women, and 1.1 million in children. Eight countries account for about two thirds of the total tuberculosis cases with India leading the count, followed by China, Indonesia, Philippines, Pakistan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, and South Africa. Multidrug resistance is still a public health problem. The WHO estimates that about half a million cases were resistant to rifampicin, and about 78% of these cases had multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Globally, the tuberculosis incidence is falling down by about 2% per year, and this needs to accelerate to 4 to 5% annually to reach the target of the WHO, the 2030 NTB strategy. They are aiming to reduce the mortality by 90% and the incidence by 80% from 2015 to 2030. An estimated 58 million lives were saved through tuberculosis diagnosis and the treatment between the years 2000 and 2015. What's about tuberculosis in Jordan? Jordan is considered a low incidence area. Low incidence, it means that the TB cases less than 10 per 100,000. You can see the figures here from 2013 to 2015. There is increase, but this increase coincides with the Syrian crisis, and many of these cases are in Syrians. Also, non-Syrians also, they have a bulk of the cases. For example, in 2015, about 167 cases out of 421 are in non-Syrians, non-Jordanian, and these are the those who works in the houses and the industrial cities. The death rate is very low, less than 0.2 per, less than 0 .2 per 100,000. What's about microbiology? Tuberculosis is caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, which contains several species that share the same culture requirements and the same antigenic structure. TB bacillus is a short rod, about 2 to 10 microns. It is acid and alcohol fast. 
which means when we stain it by Zeal Nielsen stain using carbapoxin, if we add acid and alcohol, the stain will remain. It is weakly gram positive, but we don't use the gram stain to identify acid fast bacilli. It is an obligate aerobic organism requiring oxygen for living. The generation time is prolonged, about 20 to 24 hours. That's why the culture will take weeks. For example, if we are using the solid media, it takes about four to six weeks, and the liquid media, three to four weeks. In comparison with E. coli, which has a generation time of 20 minutes, we can get E. coli culture within 48 hours. People are at risk of developing tuberculosis. Worldwide, probably the poverty, malnutrition, and overcrowding is the major risk factor for tuberculosis. HIV is a risk factor as well as immunosuppression by drugs like corticosteroids or disease like hematological malignancies, head and neck malignancies, in the stage renal disease and diabetics, alcoholics, drug addicts, and smokers are at risk of developing tuberculosis. Certain occupations like silicosis, asbestosis, coal mining, as well as healthcare workers, they are at risk of developing tuberculosis because of exposure to tuberculosis. Hey. How it is transmitted? This is a droplet infection. The infectious dose might be as low as 10 organisms in susceptible person. It is estimated that one untreated patient can infect 10 to 15 persons per year if he is not treated. What will happen if we have a patient who has pulmonary tuberculosis and that patient cough or sneeze, he will generate droplets. These, in close contact, the droplets will go down to the alveoli and they will be engulfed by the macrophages. If the immunity of the persons is okay, then the macrophages will destroy these acid fast bacilli and nothing will happen. If not, the acid fast bacilli will multiply inside the macrophages and they will release different cytokines and recruit inflammatory cells. And the acid fast bacilli will disseminate in the bloodstream, going to areas of high oxygen concentrations like the apices of the lung, the cortex of the kidney, metaphysis of the bone. Again, if the immunity of the person is okay, he will develop a delayed type granulomatous reaction and he will contain the infection. And that will lead to latent tuberculosis. So immediate clearance of the organism happen in two thirds of patients, primary tuberculosis in one third, about 5% develop primary progressive disease at the time of the primary infection and 95% percent enter the latent phase, those who develop a granulomatous reaction and will contain the acid fast bacilli in the body, preventing them from multiplication. Those who enter the latent phase later in life, probably 20, 30 years after the primary infection, he might develop reactivation if his immunity is depressed by disease or by drugs. And about 5 to 10 percent will develop reactivation tuberculosis. So we have three types of tuberculosis, the primary tuberculosis, the latent tuberculosis, and the reactivation. The latent tuberculosis, by definition, these persons are asymptomatic. They don't have any respiratory symptoms. They have normal chest X-ray, and the diagnosis is made by positive quantiferone test or positive scan test, mantle scan test. The quantiferon test is more sensitive and more specific and more reliable for diagnosing latent tuberculosis. The test, which depends on the injection of purified protein derivative, five units intradermally, and this is a type four immune reaction, so we read it after 48 to 72 hours. area of induration, and the interpretation of the skin test depend on the diameter of the reaction. Very high risk for tuberculosis like HIV, close contacts, immunosuppressed organ transplants, those on chemotherapy, 
or evidence of old TB on the X-ray or those using TNF blockers, five millimeters in duration or more is considered positive. Other, they are at risk, but less than the previous group, for example, end-stage renal disease, diabetes, leukemia, lymphoma, and underweight, more than 10% below the ideal body weight, we consider 10 millimeters as positive, and in healthy persons, 50 millimeter in duration is considered as positive. Do we need to treat or screen all people for latent tuberculosis? Of course not. There are certain groups of patients in whom treatment of latent tuberculosis is necessary because of the higher chances of reactivation. People who have HIV, we have to test them for latent tuberculosis, and if they are positive, we have to treat them. Children under five years who are household contact or close contact of TB case, those who require TNF blockers. Nowadays, the TNF blockers are used in inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatological condition. We have to check whether the patient has latent tuberculosis, and if he has it, we start anti-TB or treatment for the latent tuberculosis. And after starting the treatment of latent tuberculosis by one month, we can start the TNF blocker. Patients with silicosis, transplant recipients, and hemodialysis patients. Drugs we have for latent tuberculosis, probably the best tested regimen is the INH for nine months, 300 milligram daily for nine months. Six months is okay, but the results are less. With the nine months, uh, the efficacy is higher. We can use INH and rifepentine for three months, once weekly dose, higher dose of INH than the usual dose, or rifampicin and INH for three to four months, or rifampicin for four months. What's about the diagnosis? As we said for latent tuberculosis, the diagnosis is by quantitheron test or skin test. They are not diseased, but they are infected. About primary tuberculosis and reactivation tuberculosis, we need to do radiology, microbiology, PCR, and histology. For example, primary tuberculosis, about 70% they have fever, usually short-lived, and many cases or many persons who had primary tuberculosis, the disease will pass unnoticed and they will enter the latent phase. But those who are symptomatic, they might develop fever. It might reach 39. It might last for two to three weeks. They might have pleuritic chest pain from pleurisy, about 25%, or retrosternal chest pain. Rare symptoms include fatigue, cough, and arthralgias. The chest X-ray in primary tuberculosis, about 65% showing hyalur lymphadenopathy, pleural effusion, and pulmonary infiltrate might be seen in about one-third in each of these conditions, the pleural effusion or the pulmonary infiltrate. The natural history is 90% will control further replication of bacilli in interlatent phase. Only 5 to 10% will develop pneumonia or TB lymphadenitis as a primary progressive disease. The reactivation tuberculosis, which happens years after the primary infection, usually they have prolonged low-grade fever associated with cough, sputum production, night sweats, anorexia, weight loss, hemoptysis, and even shortness of This is the chest X-ray of primary tuberculosis showing hyalur lymphadenopathy, TB lymphadenitis. This is miliary tuberculosis. Miliary tuberculosis could happen as part of the primary infection or as a reactivation, which means that the acid fast bacilli will disseminate in the bloodstream, going to several organs, and they produce tiny nodules all through the lung fields. This is a reactivation tuberculosis, which happen in the mostly in the upper lobes, but could happen in any part of the lung, usually associated with cavitation. This is the pathology of the primary infection. This is what we call the Gwons complex. This is the 
pulmonary infiltrate and this is the lymph node associated with it. This is the miliary tuberculosis. You can see these tiny grayish nodules disseminated tuberculosis in the lung. So pre-activation tuberculosis, these patients usually have cough and sputum production. This specimen, if he is producing sputum, we send it for zeal Nielsen stain and mycobacterial culture. Also, we can send it for PCR. If the patient is having a dry cough, we can induce sputum by giving hypertonic saline nebulization, or sometimes we go for bronchoalveolar lavage, we do bronchoscopy and we inject normal saline in the affected segment or lobe of the lung and re we retrieve the fluid and send it for microbiology. If the patient has tuberculous pleural effusion, we can take the fluid, send it for zeal Nielsen stain, PCR and mycobacterial culture, or sometimes we take pleural biopsy or lung biopsy to confirm the diagnosis of tuberculosis. We send the specimens for histopathology and for mycobacterial. This is how acid fast bacilli looks in zeal Nielsen stain, these red small rods. The fluorescence microscopy is better than the usual zeal Nielsen stain and higher sensitivity. We diagnose a definite case of tuberculosis if we isolate mycobacterium tuberculosis by culture or molecular line probe assay by PCR. But these technologies are not available in the poor countries where the incidence of tuberculosis is very high. So the WHO recommend that in those countries, they rely mostly on the smear positive. To have a positive smear, you need at least 10,000 organisms per mill. So the diagnosis is confirmed if we have one smear in a quality lab or two smears if the lab is not quality assured or one positive smear and compatible chest x-ray. Although the sensitivity and positive predictive value of the smear is low, 50% percent sensitivity and 80 percent positive predictive value but this is recommended by the WHO and uh, those countries where the prevalence of tuberculosis is very high even sometimes they treat us on empirical ground anyone who has infiltrate in the chest x-ray and he has suspected tuberculosis they give him a course of antibiotic like amoxiclav for about one week to 10 days, if not clear, then they give anti-TB drugs. But here in Jordan, we don't treat unless we have a positive diagnosis. The extrapulmonary tuberculosis, lymphadenopathy, pleural, peritoneum, we have to take biopsies. We look for caseating granuloma and acid fast bacilli in the tissue, and we send a piece for mycobacterial. These are rapid tests. These are available in the TB center in Erbit. We, uh, if we suspect TB, we can send sputum sample, CSF, or pleural fluid. And this is automated molecular test. We get the result within less than two hours and tell us whether this is positive and whether the organism is resistant or sensitive to rifampicin. And the new generation also test for sensitivity for INH and even some second line drugs. This is how it looks like in histopathology. These are multinucleated giant cells and there are caseating granulomas. This is compatible with tuberculosis. If the tissue is stained for acid fast bacilli, it might be short. That's about the treatment of tuberculosis. The first anti-TB drug was introduced in the middle of the 19th century. Before that, there was no effective treatment. Bremer in Poland, he introduced the sanatoria, masahat, where they isolate the patient in certain parts of the country. They provide them with good food, hoping that their immunity will improve and they will overcome the disease. And also, they realized that these patients are a risk for the other 
person. So they isolate them to reduce the spread rate of tuberculosis. In Italy, for Lanini at the 1882, he introduced artificial pneumothorax. They make use of the fact that the acid fast bacilli require oxygen for living. So they hope that by introducing pneumothorax, artificial pneumothorax, that will collapse the part of the lung in which there is acid fast bacilli and the acid fast bacilli will be deprived from oxygen and they will die. And they used to repeat the pneumothorax every few weeks because the pneumothorax will get absorbed spontaneously. After that, they introduced thoracoplasty where they crush the ribs and collapse the part of the lung in which tuberculosis is there. And, but that result in malalignment of the spine. So later on, they produced lumbag where they insert inert substances in the pleural space to collapse the part of the lung which is affected without uh, disturbing the alignment of the spine. But all these stops in 1946. This is how the thoracoplasty, where they crush the ribs and collapse the lung. And the lumbag, these are the inner balls inserted into the pleural space, hoping that uh, depriving the acid fast bacilli from oxygen will help in curing the patient. Then in 1943, Waxman in Germany discovered the streptomycin, and the first patient treated with streptomycin was in 20th November 1944. After that, the other anti-TB drugs were introduced, the diacetazone, paraamine salicylic acid, INH, pyrazinamide, cyclosyrene, ethionamide, rifampicin, and ethambutol. And the last drug was discovered in 1962. From that time until about less than 10 years ago, no new anti-TB drug was introduced. They introduced new drugs like Vidaquiline, Delaminid, Linezolid, and others, and these are reserved for drug-resistant tuberculosis. Again, there are 13 vaccine candidates in clinical trials, but so far none is in the market. Only the BCG vaccine is still used, which has been used for a long time, and this is part of the national immunization program in Jordan and, and many other third world countries. The goals of treating tuberculosis, we are aiming to cure the patient and restore quality life and productivity, prevent death and disability, and preventing the disease relapse and reduce transmissions to others, and prevent the development and transmission of drug resistance. Tell these criteria, we have to use more than one drug to which the organism is susceptible. We have to use appropriate doses of the drugs, and the drugs must be taken regularly and preferably under supervision, because compliance is very important. Therapy must continue for sufficient. So we have what we call the first line drugs, which are rifampicin, INH, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. Uh, you have to be aware of the side effects of these drugs. For example, you have to warn the patient that his urine might change reddish in color. This is due to rifampicin. This is not hematuria. Rifampicin can induce hepatitis, thrombocytopenia, and even fever. INH can induce peripheral neuropathy, seizures, and SLE-like symptoms. Pyrazinamide can induce hepatitis, and in patients with gout, it might precipitate acute gouty arthritis. Those who are taking ethambutol, we have to warn them if they have any change in vision or blurred vision, they have to stop it because it can induce uh, optic neuritis. The second line drugs, we have four groups of second line drugs. The group A containing the fluoroquinolones, the group B, the injectable ones like canamycin, streptomycin. A group C, those of the old drugs, these are reserved for resistant cases, ethionamide, ethionamide, cyclosyrene. And group D, the new ones, the vidaquiline, dilanamide, the old drug pass, even the carbapenems, they have anti-TB 
activity, and these are reserved for drug-resistant The standard treatment for pulmonary tuberculosis is the six-month therapy, the intensified phase in the first two months containing the four drugs, rifampicin, INH, pyrazinamide, and ecambutol, and we continue with rifampicin and INH for another four months. Daily treatment is better than three times per week, where the cure rate is above 90%, while the three times per week can reach about 80-87%. For TB meningitis, we extend the course for 12 months, and we don't give ethambutol because of the poor penetration to the meninges will give instead of that streptomycin. For TB joint and bone, we extend the duration for nine months. For TB meningitis and pericarditis, we add corticosteroids to reduce the complications uh, of pericarditis like uh, constrictive pericarditis or neurological deficits. To improve the compliance with anti-TB medication, we have the fixed drug combination where in one tablet we have the four drugs and the dose according to the body weight, dose less than 50 kilograms, three tablets, between 50 and 74 tablets and above 75 tablets, preferably the anti-TB drugs to be taken one hour before breakfast for better absorption of the drugs. As we said that INH can induce peripheral neuropathy, those who are at risk of peripheral neuropathy, we give them pyridoxine, and that prevents the neuropathy. So alcoholics, diabetics, renal failure, HIV, malnourished people, and pregnant lady and breastfeeding woman, we add pyridoxine to the anti-TB drugs. How we monitor the medications? Before starting the anti-TB drugs, we have to have a baseline liver function test, CBC, visual acuity, and color vision. If all these are normal, we don't need to repeat them periodically. But we check the patient every month. We ask about side effects, and we warn him if he develops, for example, nausea, vomiting, jaundice, or blurred vision, he has to stop the medication and come back again. If we start anti-TB drugs after the first two months, we repeat the smear. If the smear was positive at the beginning, we repeat it at two months. If it is still positive, we repeat it at three months. If it's still positive, we send for culture because the patient might have drug resistance. So we send for culture and sensitivity. If the first smear is negative at two months, we repeat it at the end of the treatment at six months. If the patient at six months or five months is smear positive, then we send, we call it, this is treatment failure, and we do culture and sensitivity, probably he developed drug resistance. Why we might have positive smear at the end of the intensive phase, which is the first two months, either because the patient is not compliant with the medications or the quality of the drugs is not that good, or inadequate dosing. We have to repeat checking the patient weight every visit because if his weight increased, we have to escalate the dose of anti-TB drugs. Those who have extensive cavities, they took longer time to clear the organisms. Or those who have comorbidities like diabetics, those on steroids, the uh, smear might remain positive for longer time. Or the patient is having drug-resistant tuberculosis, or these acid-fast bacilli might be non-viable. So that's why we do culture. If they are non-viable, the culture will be negative. What we mean by drug resistance? There is several types of drug resistance. The primary means that the patient never had anti-TB drugs before, but his organisms are resistant to some anti-TB drugs. The secondary means that he was on anti-TB drugs and developed resistance later. We talk about the acid fast bacilli as a drug resistance if they are resistant to any of the first line drugs. We talk about multi-drug resistance if the 
acid fast bacilli are resistant to at least INH and rifampicin. The cure rate will drop to 50% and the treatment course has to be prolonged for 18 to 24 months. Extensively drug resistance, it means that the acid fast bacilli are resistant to INH, rifampicin, quinolone, and one of the injectable drugs. Again, the cure rate dropped to 40%. Totally drug resistant means that the organisms are resistant to all tested, locally tested drugs, and the cure rate will drop to below 20. Do we need to repeat the lab test? As I said, if the baseline lab tests are normal, we don't need to repeat them. But sometimes we need to repeat them even if they are normal. For example, in those who are suspected to have a drug reaction, those who have HIV because the complications are more, those who have baseline liver disease, we have to repeat them. Pregnant women and postpartum, we have to repeat them periodically. When we will say that the patient is cured, if smear and culture are negative at the last month and other previous occasion, we claim that he is cured. What about TB and pregnancy? If a pregnant lady develops pulmonary tuberculosis, we give the same treatment. If she had, for example, uh, TB meningitis, we don't give streptomycin, but otherwise we give the four drugs. We advise the pregnant lady to continue breastfeeding Although the anti-TB drugs are excreted in milk, but this is in small amounts and will not affect the baby. After delivery, if active TB is ruled out in the baby, we give the baby INH for six months, followed by BCG vaccine. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can send email. This is my email.